Well, good morning, Troy. I'm a pastor of discipleship and outreach here for those of us who worship together in Troy. Uh, some of you are not as familiar faces as I'd like you to be as I am usually over at 415 for Terra Kids. Uh, I just give praise to God for all of the wonderful volunteers that we have. Some of you are a part of that team. Uh, right now there's 14 volunteers that are serving with our, our babies right up through uh, fourth grade for Terra Kids. We also have our, our Terra 5-6 ministry and Terra Youth that meet uh, down there. And I'm just so grateful for those folks that serve our, our families. I have four children and uh, the three of them participate in Terra Kids or and Terra Youth, and I'm so grateful for those folks that give other time to help our kids discover the stories of the Bible, to learn of the gospel, and to begin to follow Christ, even at a young age. So thank you. Good to be here. Good to not have uh, my Terra Kids t-shirt on. I, I dressed up today. <laughs> but yeah, well, thank you, once in a while. <laughs> it's good to wear ties. <laughs> All right. Well, this morning, I... I I just want to share uh, about a biography today. I don't know, do you enjoy biographies? I do. I enjoy biographies, whether that's reading about someone's personal journey or watching a documentary uh, about how a person's life unfolded. I think that's because in biographies we can enter into their story oftentimes. So we hear about their beginnings. Maybe we can relate to where they came from. We can hear how they worked through different challenges to achieve their goals. I think biographies encourage us as we learn of the struggles that shaped who that person would become. I also think biographies are part of our spiritual DNA. Whether that's in the narratives of the Old Testament, where you see the struggles of God's people as they struggle with being faithful and and uh, the Lord continues to, to work with them and, and redeem them. We're in the, the testimony stories that we often share on Sundays or in our, our home groups, our tribes, during the week. And we share our testimonies. We recount the stuff that we went through and how the Lord brought us to the place that we are, to this point in our journey. So where are you in your journey this morning? What brings you here today? Now, many of us are here this morning at Rev Hall because that's what we do. This is our church family, right? We come here on Sundays, we, we worship, we fellowship, we enjoy being here. It's, it's the encouragement we get as we head out to the new week. Some of us might be here this morning because someone brought us. Maybe it was your parents. Maybe you had to come. Uh, some of us are here with a friend, here because someone invited you to be here this morning. Maybe you're here because you're looking for answers. You're looking for answers. You might be that person who's been in church at some point in your life, and you're here today wondering whether the Bible and Christianity really works. Is this stuff still relevant? Maybe you're going through some really hard stuff right now. As you sit here this morning, you're wondering, does God care about me? Is he there? Is he going to get me through all this stuff? Well, wherever you are on your journey, I'm glad that you're here today. I'm glad you're here with us this morning because you know what? None of us are here by accident. Today is another point in our stories. Another point that God has brought us to as he's guiding us on a journey. Hopefully a journey for you as you learn to trust in God and the promises of his word. Well, this morning I want to look at another journey. I want to look at the life of a man by the name of Augustine of Hippo. A man whose journey to faith continues to encourage us so many centuries after he lived. I'm not sure if you know much about St. Augustine. He lived a long time ago, in the 4th century, in North Africa. Uh, uh, if you don't know much about St. Augustine, you should. Quite a powerful story, a man that was quite influential. He's considered by many to be the greatest theologian in the church. He definitely had the greatest impact and scholars, both sacred and secular, uh, cannot overstate the, the influence that Augustine had on Western culture, particularly in th theology and philosophy. 
His writings continue to be discussed and have value for us as we try to make sense of of various theological issues. But this morning I want to look first at his life, at his biography. I think there's so much in there for us, wherever we are in our journeys. Augustine was a man who was born into a Christian home. At least he had a, a Christian mom. But then he spent the next three decades running away from God to pursue a life of pleasure and academic success. As a young man, Augustine didn't want to be part of that religion of his mom. He looked at the stories of the Bible as antiquated. They were unsophisticated, unable to provide the answers for the educated person that he aspired to be. Instead, Augustine would spend several decades looking for more respectful alternatives in the, in the best of Greek and Roman uh, the writers of the ancient world. But in spite of his brilliant mind and the breadth of his education, Augustine could not find the answers to the questions that nagged his soul. He came to realize that, that no amount of knowledge, no amount of human wisdom could repair his broken heart, his sinful heart. Augustine wrote in his classic autobiography, Confessions, he says, you stir a man to take pleasure in praising you because you have made us for yourself and our heart is restless until it it finds rest in you. After many years of chasing after sin and feeding his pride, Augustine would find rest for his heart in the Savior. Quite a story. Well, if you'll turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. I want us to start today by, by reading here in the, in the book of Romans, because at the end of Augustine's long journey, he saw in the words of the Apostle Paul here, yes, by the way, if you, need to, if you need a copy of the Bible, Julian's back there, he's ready to help you, just raise your hand. All right, someone up front. So Augustine saw in Romans chapter 7, in the words of the Apostle Paul, he saw that battle that had been raging inside his heart. And he had found that there was no other place for him to find rest but in his Savior. So turn in to Romans chapter 7. I'm going to read in verse 14. Got a bit, of, a bit to cover here. All right, verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I, have on the, I, I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand what my, my own actions, for I, do not, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Verse 21, so I find it to be the law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members." Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. If you'll bow and I'm going to open with prayer this morning. Our Father, as we look at the life of Augustine, Lord, we can't help but begin by thanking you for your eternal sovereign wisdom, Lord. Your wisdom that it from Eternity past planned to send your son, Father, to give his life for us, that he could purchase us out of sin's bondage and make us free. Lord, thank you that the salvation comes by grace, as none of us are able, from this passage we just read, we know we're not able to overcome the condition of our heart. Like Augustine, Lord, we must respond to your grace by faith. 
So we thank you for your word. We thank you for the story of those who've come before us. We pray you'd open up our eyes to what we need to see and our ears to what we need to hear. In your name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, for this morning, our roadmap, we're going to take a look at Augustine's journey. As I said, his, his biography is powerful. I think it still has a lot of uh, relevance for us today. In fact, I was talking with someone yesterday about confessions, and this person said, as I was reading it, it sounded like it was written recently. And it's true, this, this, uh, this classic biography that Augustine wrote actually uh, changed the whole genre. There's never been a, a biography that's been written since then that did not somehow reflect the ground that, that he, had, he had prepared, the trail he had blazed. So we look at his life. Then we're going to look at his conversion. Powerful story. We found rest in Christ. And we're going to take a look at Augustine's calling as the African father as he became known. And then we're going to look at Augustine's legacy, how he pointed us to the gospel. So let's take a look at this. Augustine, the restless wanderer. So he was born in the 4th century in Thagaste, uh, North Africa, which is now would be now modern Algeria. He was born to a middle-class family. He had some opportunities, some privileges. His mother, or excuse me, his father was uh, Patricius. And I start with Patricius because he, he didn't mention his dad a lot. I don't think he had a great relationship with his dad. He seemed kind of distant. Uh, Patricius was a, was a pagan in the sense that he was not a Christian. He participated in the, in the, the Roman worship gods and all the, the Roman worship of his day. Didn't seem like he was a real serious guy about his faith, but did it more probably for the social customs and business opportunities. We know that uh, Patricius wasn't a great husband either. Now his mother, Monica, Monica was a devout Christian woman. She's known as a woman of prayer who never gave up on her rebellious son. In fact, Monica would come, to be, she would come to be known as one of the most uh, revered mothers in church history. As she remained faithful to God in, in spite of so much disappointment and discouragement, she prayed diligently for her son for decades that he would come to know the Lord and would put his faith in Christ. Well, Monica married an unbelieving man who was not always faithful to her, which was not uncommon in those times. We don't know why Augustine's parents married, possibly for financial reasons. That, that certainly happened then. But this unequal yoke brought uh, her much heartbreak. I think this is a reminder to those who are looking to get married. If you, if you choose to join together with someone who does not know the Lord, you're going to have some significant challenges in your marriage and in your life, particularly when it comes to raising children. Augustine never had that good example of a dad who loved Jesus, of a dad who modeled a kind of righteous life that God calls us to. As you pursue that life partner, think about how you will need to care for your children together. If that person you marry doesn't know Christ, then you're going to find yourself discipling your children all alone. And for those of us, or those of you who might be in here that are... <clears throat> currently married to someone who's not a believer, who doesn't know Christ, be encouraged by Monica. Be encouraged by her. In spite of the challenges of raising her kids in the faith with a parent who wasn't on the same page, Monica remained faithful. And the Lord blessed her faithfulness. In, in the pages of Confessions, St. Augustine shared over and over again about his mother's great faith and her diligence and how much it impacted him. He loved his mother greatly. With all the philosophy and pagan literature that, that he, he loved and became a great professor. He could not completely dismiss those Bible stories that his mom had shared with him at a young age. So moms, be encouraged. You have an important job to do. Well, Monica would suffer as only a mom can as she watched her son walk away from the faith, watched her son get involved in all sorts of sinful relationships and just be that rebellious kid. But throughout all those years, she never gave up hope. And Monica never stopped praying. Again, such a great example for, to mothers. Well, Augustine was sent off to school at age 11. They saw that he was a bright boy, wanted him to get an education. 
but it was during these years he developed a reputation of being quite a rascal. <laughs> he probably spent more time getting disciplined in school at that point than actually studying, but I think that's what can happen sometimes to bright kids. At age 16, the family ran out of money. We don't know why, but Augustine had to return home. He would write that this unstructured time he had uh, was, was quite enjoyable, but his heart continued to wander, and he and his friends just got in a lot of trouble during that time, like, like teenagers can do. Well, it was during, during that time of his uh, typical teen mischief years that Augustine began to get glimpses into his own heart. He wrote later in Confessions, which, by the way, I think every Christian should read. It's a tough read, uh, as obviously was written a long time ago, but at the same time, it, it has this almost modern feel as he's, he's pouring out his heart and the struggles that he's going through. But in his, in his classic autobiography, Confessions, uh, he, he shared that he was guilty of, of pursuing romantic relationships, romantic encounters, just to satisfy his lustful desires. He, would, he, he shared that he would use his girlfriends for his sexual pleasures and not care that much if he, um, how he, it affected them. He wrote about the shame he had of this behavior. Yet, the lust in his heart would overpower him, and he would quickly move on to the next adventure because he could not control what was going on within him. Well, you might be familiar with another story in Augustus, his, his teen years, the story of the stolen pears. If you've ever taken a philosophy class, I'm sure that's come up. When uh, Augustine was a teenager, him and some peers climbed the neighbor's fence to steal some pears. And you're like, okay. But this was quite a milestone in his life. He climbed the fence to steal these pears, not because they were necessarily hungry or because they needed pears or didn't have any. In fact, he would say, we had nicer pears in in his own backyard. But, But they climbed the fence to steal those pears solely for the fun of it. In fact, later on, after they stole the pears and they were laughing, they went to another neighbor's house and tossed them to the pigs. For a moment that evening, Augustine saw that ugly part of human nature that sins for the pleasure of sinning. That hurts people because it's enjoyable. I think that scared him. Later he wrote in Confessions, the fruit was beautiful but it was not that which my miserable soul coveted. I had a quantity of better pears, but those that I picked, I did solely for the motive of stealing. I threw away that, uh, what I uh, had picked. My feasting was only on the wickedness which I took pleasure in enjoying. Now, we might not think it's that big of a deal to abscond with some fruit, but in the Roman world, stealing was much more serious. And I think that's why it was much more, that much more enjoyable for Augustine and his friends. He had fun stealing pears because he knew how much trouble he could get into. I think what he realized is that as he was breaking those laws, he could feel like he was the maker of laws. He could be in God's place. Well, as much as young Augustine enjoyed these adventures with his friends, he went to bed that night with a, 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 knowing that deep down his soul He was a sinner. He shared later in Confessions, he said, The theft itself was nothing. My pleasure lay in the act of theft. And for that reason, I was miserable. Well, Augustine's potential would not be wasted. A family friend saw uh, that in him, and he paid for him to resume his schooling. So Augustine was able to move from his village to the big city of Carthage, where he really began to excel in his education. Augustine's intellect and abilities caused him to stand out among his friends, among his classmates. He was smart and he knew it. He also found that whatever fun he could have in his small town, the opportunities were even greater in Carthage. I think it was like the Madison, Wisconsin of North Africa. That big college town, lots of, lots of opportunities for trouble. As hard as he studied, Augustine played harder. In confessions, he would painfully remember the wasted years of pleasing his flesh. He, would, he tried to dial it down, but his lusts in his heart were so great. His restless soul continued to wander, and the darkness grew deeper in his heart. Well, at this period of time, as he was finishing his school, Augustine's parents wanted him to marry 
I think they figured somehow that would help him settle down. But he didn't want to do that. He wanted to finish his education. He wanted to get his career going. So he, he really resisted that. And his parents who, who wanted him to be successful, they didn't force the issue. I think Augustine uh, saw that as a problem. He realized that probably would have helped him to settle down. I think that's a good reminder to us parents. Reminder to us parents about making sure that we have the right priorities for our children and the right definitions of success. You know, why are kids to do well in school, to find a successful career is good. All right, but our number one priority, folks, as Christian parents, is in the discipleship of our children. Well, after completing his studies, Augustine remained in Carthage, where he was able to become a professor of rhetoric, which is something we don't, we don't, we don't really think of. It's, it was basically this, uh, this science or career of, of uh, communication and arguing. and, and, and it, it was the, really the, the field that if you wanted to be successful in business or government or politics or whatever, uh, rhetoric was the place to be. And Augustine was doing quite well in that field. Well, during his time in, in Carthage, he continued to live that worldly life, much to the heartbreak of his mother. Eventually, he would settle down with a woman with whom he'd share a home for nearly a decade as his mistress. In confession, August, uh, uh, Augustine speaks of his genuine love that he had for her. They eventually had a child together, but uh, Augustine could not marry her. It's hard for us to understand, but she was from a lower class, uh, social class, apparently. And in 4th century, fourth century Roman world, such marriages were not permitted. So Augustine was in a tough situation. He had to, uh, eventually had to send her away. Had to break, break off that relationship. They had a child together. His son continued to live with him, and, and she, she would go, <clears throat> go back to her family. And, and it's just another reminder about those of us who are currently in the dating scene and looking for a relationship. Be wise and trust God to guide you as you date with integrity. Augustine admitted that he first pursued this woman for a sexual relationship only to grow deeply in love with her, which, which often happens, right? In the end, those selfish desires that, that initiated that relationship caused deep harm to both him and, and to this woman that he loved. It was very painful. Guys and girls, be careful about getting into relationships that you know aren't good. Don't get intimately connected with someone that you shouldn't be with. Don't start what you can't finish. It's a good reminder. Well, Augustine taught successfully there in Carthage for a few years, but he began to wonder what opportunities might, there might be for him beyond North Africa. Better schools, better students, better pay. Soon he was looking to the bright lights, big city, across the, the Mediterranean to Rome. So, he, so an, an opportunity came for him to go to Rome, he, he, where he, in, uh, he encountered the, 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 the huge city there in the ancient world. He met with uh, folks that introduced him to new ideas, new philosophies. He continued to look for that wisdom, that insight, those, those answers to his questions that he had not yet found, that had eluded him thus, thus far. Well, after a few years in Rome, he kind of lost its luster, wasn't enjoying it as much as he thought he would, and he wondered if life had more to offer. So in 384, Augustine was given the opportunity to teach rhetoric in Milan. Milan was a city that had become very significant in the Roman world at that time as the capital of the, the Roman Empire had been moved there, and that's where the, the emperor lived. Well, by going there, uh, he was awarded this faculty in a, in a school that was connected with the emperor. All right, and so think about that for a moment. Here he was at age 30, and he'd reached the top of his profession. He's teaching rhetoric in Milan. He held one of the most prestigious posts in the world. Although his resume was complete, Augustine was still restless in his soul. Well, his mother, Monica, what a good mom. She went with him to Rome and went with him to North Africa. Or maybe she was a helicopter mom, I don't know. But she loved, <laughs> she loved Augustine. She stuck with him. Eventually, 
as he was in Milan, she was able to get her son to go back to church. As Augustine began to attend the preaching, uh, to attend a service so he could hear the preaching of Ambrose, the bishop of Milan. Now he would have said at that point he was just going there because Ambrose was one of the greatest speakers of the day and he wanted to hear his wisdom and, and how he, the skills that which, with he delivered his sermons. Augustine was an accomplished scholar and a brilliant thinker, yet he found in Ambrose a humble and kind pastor who could match his intellect and his breadth of study. Also, Augustine found it fascinating that a man with so much education and, and, and intelligence could look to the stories of the Bible for answers. It just shocked him. Much to his surprise, Augustine was hearing real wisdom and insight that he had not found in all the poets, all the philosophers that, had, that he'd been studying. For the first time in his life, he was learning from the pages of the Bible. As impressed he was with, with uh, the bishop's intelligence and skillfulness in the pulpit, it was Ambrose the pastor that truly moved Augustine's heart. He referred to Ambrose as a friendly man, a friendly man, a man who would talk to the average person the, the, that would come to his services and yet would take the time to, to sit with Augustine and wrestle through these deep intellectual questions that he had. In this way, Ambrose became the Christian father that Augustine never had. Well, Augustine's journey was coming to a boiling point. In the summer of <clears throat> 436, Augustine found that his inner struggles in his soul was bringing him to a point where he needed to make a decision. You may be familiar with Augustine's story. He was out in the backyard, sitting under some, sitting under some fig trees, reading a, a book for, a, a, about a, a monk. This guy that had been very wealthy, gave his money away, and had moved out in the desert to start a monastery. And in that moment, Augustine knew that, that, <clears throat> that he was in poverty compared with the riches of St. Anthony, that St. Anthony had found as he had given up all to surrender his life to Christ. And he sat there in the backyard that day. As he sat there, he heard the voice of a child say, pick it up and read it. Pick it up and read it. Hear the voice of a child. And he looked around, where is this child coming from? And he didn't know if it was a, a child over on the other side of the fence in the, in the neighbor's yard or if it was the voice of an angel. Not that it really matters, but God was speaking to him. So the African father, he reached for a copy of the, of the scriptures that he had with him. And he did what sometimes we do. He just went to the first place his, hand, his finger could find. He turned to Romans chapter 13. Romans 13, verses 13 and 14, where the apostle Paul writes, Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. In that moment, Augustine knew that the Lord was speaking to him. He was speaking to the life that he had been leading for <clears throat> 30 plus years. He wrote later, I neither wished or needed to read further. At once, with the last words of the sentence, it was as if the light of relief from my anxiety flooded my heart. All shadows of doubt were dispelled. Finally, the restless wander, wanderer had found rest for his soul. So Augustine was baptized later on, Easter Sunday of 387, and he had decided at that point he was going to resign from his teaching position with all the the prestige that that had for him. He was going to return to North Africa. He was going to start a community of Christians back in his hometown. Well, so he began to do that. And actually, as he and his mother and his son were beginning their move back to Carthage, Monica became ill. Like so often happened in, in those days, a person would be sick and, and uh, it wouldn't go, wouldn't go well. She would die in Italy before they could even board the ship for home. But on her deathbed, Monica had peace. Monica had, had peace after years of praying for her son and pursuing him wherever his career took him. 
Monica had seen him come to faith in Christ. She was ready to meet the Lord. Again, she should be remembered as an example to Christian mothers of the important role that you play in your children's spiritual development. Think about all the investments that you can make in your child for the gospel, even if it takes years. Moms, be encouraged. The job of being a mother, we know it's not easy a lot of days and certainly not glorious, but it's important. God used Monica to be that voice that continued to speak to Augustine. Continue to call him back to the Lord. Well, Augustine, I want to talk a little bit about Augustine's calling as, as, as a pastor, as a shepherd. Pastor of Africans. After his return to North Africa, the church in Hippo, which is near Carthage, recognized Augustine's giftedness as a teacher and a pastor. They could see it in him, so they, they ordained him as a priest. To no surprise, he soon became uh, known for, for his preaching ministry. He was challenging believers to live obediently to the Savior, and he was calling on non-Christians to put their faith in God, and and people were responding and being converted. It was quite a ministry. A few years later, the church there recognized his leadership, and they appointed him the, the Bishop of Hippo in 395. And for the next 35 years, Augustine would labor tirelessly to strengthen the church there in Hippo and throughout North Africa. Augustine would be known in church history as the African father, because that was his calling. He declared in a letter to a friend, I am an African writing to Africans. Not only was he a great pastor, he was also a theologian, as we mentioned. No one has been more significant to the formation of our theology than the African father. We can't wrestle with, with theological issues from God's word without interacting with ideas that Augustine shared from his studies. In fact, later on in the Protestant Reformation, where we would trace our roots here at Terra Nova, there's preachers, pastors, theologians like, like Luther and Calvin that would look to Augustine to help them understand the teachings of the Bible, particularly the Apostle Paul and, and things like justification by grace through faith alone. It would not be an overstatement to say that only the New Testament writers had a greater impact on the church on us than Augustine did. Well, Augustine was an accomplished intellectual with a mind that few in his day could better, yet it was in the pages of the Bible that he came to know the truth, where he came to know the Savior. Theology for Augustine was much more than a, 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 just an academic pursuit. He had come to know God personally after a long journey of running from Christ. Augustine never forgot the decades of sin that ruled his heart. As much as he pursued wisdom, and knowledge there's no cure for the condition of his heart. Well, during his time as, as, as bishop, a new, there was a new teaching that was on the rise. And I think I want to focus on this for a little bit because it gives you just a look into the incredible heritage that he left for us. As a, as a pastor and a theologian, Augustine had a job to do to shepherd God's flock, protect them from things that were, for, that were harmful. And during his time as a bishop, uh, there was a monk from Great Britain who had grown to fame during his time as a teacher in Rome. In in 410, Pelagius moved to Carthage. He moved right there to to Augustine's backyard. And he began to teach things that were affecting the health of the church. And as a good pastor, Augustine had to address it. Uh, Pelagius had been uh, troubled during his ministry back in Great Britain about the nominalism that was rampant in the church in his day. He saw a church where people who claimed to be Christians lived immoral lives and cons- inconsistent with the teachings of Christ. And we, when, when they were confronted, too often these folks would, would look back to their baptisms and think, well, I've been baptized, therefore I don't have to worry <clears throat> whether or not my life is quite up to what it should be. Pelagius concluded that people must take their life, or t- must be taught to take seriously the call of Jesus to live a devoted life, which at the surface sounds good, but unfortunately, Pelagius came to some 
very unbiblical con- conclusions. I'm just going to talk through those a little bit. Pelagius saw the idea of God's unconditional grace as detrimental. He believed that the only way for a person to secure his or her salvation was by living obediently. Grace was something a person needed to earn by their faithfulness to Christ. As I said, eventually he gained a large following. And he, he, he started to criticize Augustine's teachings. That justification comes by grace through faith and is not contingent on whether a person merits it. Pelagius believed that, that things taught by Augustine and the other church fathers <clears throat> caused spiritual laziness and led to an impure church. He suggested that the tr- traditional understanding of grace was ineffective. And he put forth several theological assumptions that differed greatly in, from what the church had been teaching, what Augustine had been teaching. He taught that our spiritual condition uh, was not nearly as, as uh, serious as what Augustine had said, what Augustine had read in the pages of Scripture. He denied that a person's born with a truly sinful nature that condition where our hearts are prone to selfishness and sin. Instead, Pelagius believed that people are spiritually good, able to move toward God if they choose to turn from their sin and faithfully follow after Christ. Pelagius disagreed with Augustine that sin was a natural outcome. he, He disagreed with Augustine. He said that sin was a natural outcome, not of our broken soul, but of misunderstanding, of bad teaching. It's a struggle against bad habits. We sin when we have bad thinking and we succumb to bad attitudes. Thus Pelagius saw that our struggle is more about fixing our behavior than needing salvation in one's soul. He went so far as to claim that devout Christians could just even stop sinning if they would just fully devote themselves to to the teachings of Christ and live a devout life. Which I think Augustine found ridiculous. Pelagius taught that salvation is achievable by living the perfect life as we leave behind bad habits and unbiblical thinking that causes us to be out of harmony with Christ. With such a a positive view of mankind, the Pelagians naturally begin to miss the significance of Christ's redemptive work on our behalf. For the Pelagians, Jesus just provided an example for us to follow. They emphasize his wonderful teachings and his selfless sacrifice. Yet they missed his sacrifice on Good Friday. He became a friend who would show us the way to God. So why am I talking about this? If you stop and think about some of these things that Pelagius was teaching, they may sound familiar to us. Throughout the centuries, the heresies of Pelagius have been recycled different times. Even not too recently. We, we <clears throat> hear it in many of the mainline denominations who in the 19th and 20th centuries would embrace, we would think of liberal theology or modernism. Pastors and theologians in those circles would often question what the Bible teaches about sin and the condition of the human heart. The biblical ideas that, that Augustine recognized about our sinful condition were dismissed as, as pessimistic, as old-fashioned. They taught that our problem was, the problem was that we need a better education, modern teachings to correct the negative ways of, our, of thinking and the old-fashioned ideas that, that caused our dysfunction. We've seen it more recently in the, in the teaching of some of the preachers that you see on TV in the last few decades. They don't talk much about sin and our need for our selfish heart to be transformed. Instead, they... <clears throat> These spiritual gurus challenge people to believe in God's best plans for them. No longer is the good news about forgiveness of sin. Instead, it's about improving our lives. That's what God really wants. They're gospels that individuals who, find, who can, uh, can find it in themselves to trust God for their prosperity are able to unlock blessings and find empowerment. In both cases, the condition of a person's soul is not the real need, nor is sin something all that serious. Not surprising, neither group needs Jesus all that much. Not the Jesus that suffered, the Jesus who died that scandalous death on the cross to pay for our sins and to rescue us from bondage. Well, Augustine knew how ridiculous it was to think that a person could fix the brokenness in his own soul. He had tried to do that for nearly three decades. After years of looking for answers in philosophers and poets, Augustine found 
that his life needed to be anchored in the foundation of God's word. He responded to, to the Pelagians by going back to the Bible, went back to the creation story, dug deep into the writings of the Apostle Paul. He looked at the, God's redemptive plan as that, that pattern for us to understand what God was doing <clears throat> through us, what our condition was. He looked at this idea that we were created good in Genesis 2, that is correct, but in Genesis 3, that harmony that we had with God was lost. Instead of trusting in the Lord, Adam and Eve were tempted by the desires to be independent of God. They ate that fruit. In this story, Augustine saw the story of all of us. The first man and woman took the fruit of the tree for the same reasons that Augustine stole the pears. For the thrill of the sin. Wanting to be independent of God. Instead of trusting in God, they would do things their way and their choice brought condemnation and devastation, both themselves and to all of their descendants. We see that clearly explained in Romans chapter 2 and 3 and 4 and 5. And we, we see that, that redemptive story of we were created <clears throat> and sin brought the fall and left us condemned, but Christ was promised. He was promised there in Genesis 3 as that one who would crush the serpent's head. Augustine knew that left to ourselves we would remain lost in our sin, but God's grace by the Holy Spirit would draw us to him. Salvation comes only by God's grace through faith in Christ. The obedient life was not a requirement for salvation, but a fruit of God's grace. <clears throat> we don't need to transform ourselves in order for God to give his grace to us. That transformation comes as we respond to the call of the gospel. As we receive his grace as humble sinners. So the Lord can forgive us of our sins, make us his own, and transform us for the in, from the inside out. Augustine's journey ended at the cross. How about you? As the band comes back up, let me close with these questions for you to consider. I asked you earlier, where are you in your journey? I don't know about you, but as you're hearing the story of Augustine, maybe you can relate to some of that. Maybe you're here today because you are looking for answers. I want to point you to this, the word of God to find the answers that Augustine found. Have you looked honestly at the condition of your heart? Have you acknowledged your need for a savior? Have you found his mercy at the cross? Have you received his grace by faith? In a moment, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper where we can be grateful to God that he saved us and he made us his people. And we want to celebrate that together, the grace that we have in Christ. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you so much that we can receive the bread and the wine this morning. And remember, it was your body and it was your blood that you shed for us. Lord, so you could rescue us out of our sin, so that our restless souls could find rest in you. We thank you, Lord. We celebrate your wonderful name. Amen.